They say nothing is ever lost, and it's true. Let's discover ships frozen in time. The first one is truly fascinating. Here, the Antikytheria shipwreck. It's a Greek trading ship from the first century BCE. It's located on the east side of the Greek island of Antikythera and at the merging point of the Aegean and Mediterranean seas. Around 2,000 years later, in 1900, a group of Greek sponge divers discovered the wreck. They were going to Tunisia, yet they were forced to find shelter from a storm on a nearby island. Since they couldn't go anywhere due to the storm, they decided to look for sponges until the weather got calmer. One of the divers discovered the shipwreck at depths of around 130 feet. Imagine someone going for a sponge hunt, but getting out to the surface with archaeological treasures. The captain of the sponge boat talked to the Greek officials about what they had found. The officials sent two ships to the wreckage. The salvage operation was successful and discoveries are now in Greece's National Archaeological Museum in Athens. The findings included three life-sized marble horses, jewelry, coins, and hundreds of works of art, including a seven-foot-tall colossus statue of Hercules. Among these treasures, Antikythera of Phoebe, a bronze statue of a young man caught more attention. Because the Ephib doesn't comply with any familiar iconographic model, and there are no known copies of his type, he held a spherical object in his hand. Scholars have different theories of who that person could be, but they are not in a consensus yet. More than 70 years later, Jacques-Yves Cousteau and his team went to the area and recovered hundreds more artifacts and the remains of four people. Interestingly, they discovered a complex set of interlocking gears capable of predicting the movement of the sun, moon, and several planets. The mechanism can also show the times of solar and lunar eclipses years into the future. Think of this Antikythera mechanism as an early computer calendar, you know, to plan significant events like agricultural activities, religious rituals, and Olympic games. These artifacts found in the Antikythera wreckage are some of the most important findings in modern archaeology. Just the Antikythera mechanism itself has changed our perception of the limits of ancient technology. The mechanism has a sophisticated design and was made over a thousand years ago. After all these amazing discoveries, experts believe that the wreckage site has remained largely unexplored and is mostly because of its location and the landscape of the seafloor on which the ship rests. The wreck is too deep for scuba divers but too shallow to use something like a submersible. A survey made on the seafloor in 2012 showed evidence of a second wreck about 800 feet to the south. It's clear that this area has a lot to offer humanity. What would happen if those sponge hunters didn't go to the area? Scientists found a shipwreck in Antarctica at the bottom of the Weddell Sea 107 years after it sank. The name of the ship was Endurance, and it was the lost vessel of Antarctic explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton. Scientists who laid eyes on it decades later say it is among the greatest undiscovered shipwrecks ever. That is why they filmed the whole discovery. The video shows the remains of the Endurance and proves it is still in remarkable condition. It has been sitting in 10,000 feet of water for over a century, yet it looks like it sank very recently. So the story goes like this. The ship was crushed by ice and sank in 1915. Shackleton and his crewmates had to escape by themselves in small lifeboats. From then on, it was all about survival. Shackleton imagined to get his crew to safety, then the ship sank. Yes, this is a pretty impressive story, but why did scientists prize this ship? Firstly, Shackleton's Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition sailed to make the first land crossing of Antarctica. Yes, the crew was trapped in ice, but the intention was important. Secondly, it's about the challenge itself of finding the shipwreck. The Weddell Sea is almost always covered in thick sea ice. You know, the same ice that made the Endurance sink. Getting near the presumed sinking location is super hard, let alone being able to conduct research. Experts of the modern expedition team foresaw the time when the lowest extent of Antarctic sea ice would come using satellite images. They realized that the weather was in their favor to start an expedition. Dr. John Shears said that they have successfully completed the world's most difficult shipwreck search, fighting against constantly shifting sea ice, blizzards, and temperatures decreasing to negative 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeesh, I can't imagine the worst conditions in Antarctica if these conditions are in their favor. Lastly, look at this. It's timbers. They're very much intact. Plus, 
you can read the ship's name. It's still visible. Marine archaeologist Menson Bound says that this is the finest wooden shipwreck he has ever discovered. He has 50 years of career experience, so I believe the guy. So how come the wood is not rotten? Dr. Michelle Taylor, a deep-sea polar biologist, said that there has been little wood deterioration because the wood-munching animals are not in this forest-free region of Antarctica. Workers of a coal mine in East Serbia discovered three shipwrecks that had been there for at least 1,300 years. The largest shipwreck is an ancient Roman fleet. It's around 50 feet long with a flat bottom. It's estimated that the ship could carry a crew of 30 to 35 people. Looking at its hull, you can see the marks of repairs. Wow, this one had a lengthy career. You know, it gives us insight into more than a thousand years ago. The two smaller vessels, on the other hand, match descriptions of boats used by Slavic groups to attack the Roman frontier. These two have been discovered under mud and clay in an ancient riverbed. Apparently, in those times, there was a Roman base in a place called Viminasium City. Interestingly, Viminasium was a provincial capital with an estimated 40,000 inhabitants in the 4th century CE. For comparison, it was even larger than Pompeii. The Kostelach coal mine is a center of hidden gems. Archaeologists had found evidence of ancient human and animal activity here before. For instance, in 2012, experts found bones of at least five woolly mammoths, which went extinct about 10,000 years ago. The year was 1854, and the SS Arctic, the fastest passenger liner of its time, set out to cross the Atlantic. As it sailed through the misty veil, it slowly disappeared into the unknown. The Collins Line, an American shipping company, was started in 1818 and only began seriously trading in the transatlantic by 1835. Its steamships crossed the Atlantic from Liverpool to New York within just 10 days. Doesn't sound like a great speed today, I know, but back then, the same thing took other ships several weeks. Light on the water with their wooden hulls, powering through with a strong steam engine, those steamships were the favorite choice for many high-profile people. What could go wrong with such an advanced ship, they thought. This reminds me of some other ship everyone believed to be unsinkable. But anyway, back to the Collins Line. It grew to be a serious contender on transatlantic routes, with only one other competitor, the Cunard's Line. It was a British company also aiming to be the main force through the Arctic Passage. In 1835, the company received a new ship that traveled to Liverpool and came back to New York with the largest cargo ever at that time. From then, the Collins Line was steadily growing. It seemed like there would only be future successes for it. Unfortunately, their lavish ships became costly to run with the amount of coal used. Massive power along with weak wooden hulls meant they needed many repairs after each voyage. So, every trip ended up being expensive. But since the ships were safe and had a great reputation, people were willing to pay the price, and the company was definitely not in crisis. They had achieved something no one had managed to do before them. Like I told you, their ships crossed the Atlantic in a whopping 10 days. And Edward Collins, the owner, was very determined to maintain the pace. Their five ships easily outran the Cunard's line of only three. With this great praise, it provided more attention. Though the Cunard's ships were slower with their iron hulls, they believed there was still profit regardless of how slowly they sailed. Among Collins' ships, the Arctic, the third of them to be launched, was the largest, reaching 284 feet long with two side lever steam engines, each with 1,000 horsepower. The paddle wheels made 16 revolutions a minute when at full speed. At the time of its launch, the press called it the most stupendous vessel ever constructed in the United States. But glamour and fame couldn't avoid what would come next. On the 27th of September, the Arctic was on its journey from Liverpool to New York, continuing a speed pace through the thick fog. It's possible that by that moment, after four years of record-breaking trips, the crew became overconfident with their sailing and the ship. Going only 50 miles from Newfoundland, they carelessly continued through the fog with no radio contact, 
sonar, or any other form of identifying objects equipped only with Morse code. A smaller ship, the SS Vesta, which operated as a fishing vessel, often worked around Newfoundland. It was passing through the same path as the Arctic and crashed into its side. Shocked by the collision, the captain of the Arctic offered help to the much smaller Vesta, but it was soon clear that the damage that seemed minor on the Arctic was far worse. Beneath the waterline, a hole was letting water into the hull. The cost of the much faster wooden hull now seemed less valuable. They steered toward land, trying to plug the holes, but they weren't doing so well, and the seawater continued to pour in, filling up higher and pushing the ship down. And finally, once the engine room was full, it put out the boilers, taking away the massive power the Arctic was once legendary for. They moved slowly until coming to a complete stop. The ship continued to sink, and the order was to abandon it. At the time, maritime law allowed for the Arctic to carry only six lifeboats, only capable of saving 180 people. The crew and some of the passengers managed to push their way aboard and took most of the seats on those boats. Things were pretty wild, and everyone forgot about their manners, not letting the ladies and the youngest ones board first. It took four hours for the Arctic to sink. 150 crew and 250 passengers were on board. Those that weren't able to find a lifeboat made a desperate attempt to build their own rafts from parts of the ship. Two days later, only three boats made it safely to the shore. The other three were never found. Believe it or not, the rescue party also saved some people that had been clinging to the wreckage for two days. Unlike the crew, the captain went down with the Arctic, but amazingly survived. He would be only one of 85 people that made it out of the 400 on board. When the news arrived two weeks later, the public responded with great sadness to the losses. Great anger soon followed towards the poor safety measures in the crew. The press published demands to change the laws for more lifeboats. It only made sense to have enough for every person on board a ship. But they ignored those requests. This neglect would lead to more disasters in the future. Enough lifeboats would only come into maritime law some 60 years later, after the disaster of the Titanic. Edward Collins' wife and two children were also aboard the ship and didn't return. He was heartbroken, but didn't stop running his business. The Collins line still had a reputation to uphold, the biggest, fastest, and most luxurious on the Atlantic. Edward Collins would now build an even better ship than any other. It was named the Adriatic, and it was the largest ship in the world, 354 feet long. With two alternating steam engines that had never been built of this size. These steam engines at the time were at the height of engineering, though today you can only see them in models and toys. With the new addition of two masts, the Adriatic would also be able to sail if needed. Luckily, they made some lessons from the disaster of the Arctic. But before their new ship, the Adriatic, was built, another disaster had occurred. The sister ship of the Arctic had also sunk. They believed this second ship was desperate to stay in front of the Cunard's line and hit an iceberg somewhere during the race. This weird contest took the lives of 141 people. It has recently become a popular location for many tourists looking for the perfect place to get away from it all. If you're lucky enough to catch a sunny day here, it's like no other, I can assure you. Chances are, you'll end up having loads of foggy days, but let's be honest, they have a special allure of their own. This enchanting smile-shaped island is called Sable Island. It's located 190 miles from mainland Nova Scotia. It wasn't accessible to the general public until 2013. That's when it was added to the list of National Parks of Canada. You can get here either by plane or by water. But what's so enchanting about this place anyway? There must be something since the yearly tourist count is growing every year. Firstly, there's a spectacular number of wild horses here. There are between 200 and 500 horses roaming free all over the island. 
There's also a large population of gray seals. The place is also the only breeding location of a rare bird species called the Ipswich Sparrow. If you're already considering a trip here, there are some things you need to know first. Remember that fog I mentioned earlier? Well, it turns out that Sable Island is the foggiest place in the Canadian Maritimes. I'm talking about approximately 127 foggy days each year. During such days, Sable Island literally disappears underneath a thick layer of fog. You won't be able to explore the place on your own either. The local regulations state that visitors need to travel within a group, and they also need to keep a 197-foot distance from the wildlife they can encounter here. As charming as this place may be, it holds a dark secret hidden beneath the sandy dunes, and it has nothing to do with beautiful creatures living here or the island's unique vegetation. Apart from being known from its horses and seals, Sable Island is infamous for an overwhelming number of shipwrecks. Over the years, about 350 ships have ended their lives here, on these sandbars. When survivors described their experiences, they usually mentioned harsh weather conditions near this mysterious island. The island also made its way into literature when it was described in a book called The Perfect Storm, which was written by Sebastian Younger and published in 1997. The book was so successful that it was later adapted for the big screen in 2000, with George Clooney playing the leading role. The first recorded shipwreck near Sable Island dates back to 1583. The boat was named the HMS Delight and was under the command of British adventurer and explorer Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Only 17 people managed to survive the catastrophe by escaping in a small boat. Records mention that they spent seven days at sea before reaching the shores of Newfoundland. In 1884, another vessel named the Nicosia struggled in the thick fog as well. The ship was completely destroyed, but fortunately, all 18 crew members managed to survive. The captain's son was almost lost at sea when a lifeboat capsized when he was climbing into it. He somehow managed to stay underneath the lifeboat, which was completely submerged. When this lifeboat righted, he eventually emerged from the water and was rescued for the second time. The years between 1947 and 1999 were relatively quiet on the island. In 1999, though, a yacht called the Merrimack ran aground near the shore of the island at about 2 a.m. on July 27th. The 40-foot fiberglass boat had a crew of only three people. Natural gas exploration workers, who were luckily not far away, rescued them. The crew managed to fly safely to Halifax the next day. The owner of the Merrimack tried to recover his boat by hiring local fishermen. Unfortunately, this operation was unsuccessful, since only the fittings of the yacht were eventually saved. It took no more than six weeks for the sand and waves to crush and completely break up the hull of the Merrimack. So what is it about this place that's so dangerous for boats? Does it have anything to do with the weather? Or maybe there's other forces at play? The explanation turns out to be a bit more complex, and it wasn't easy to figure out, at least not way back in the 1500s. First of all, the island is located close to one of the world's richest fishing grounds. Since it's also near one of the major shipping routes between Europe and North America, hundreds of vessels sail past it each year. The likelihood of shipwreck increases when there are so many boats roaming around the area. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.